Scott for Scott's here. Do you hear that? Bring the mic in close. That's not how the grass should sound. There's weeds everywhere on this lawn. It's time to take action with Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It gets three jobs done at once, kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds your lawn so it keeps growing strong. Ah, oh, much better. Get a bag of Scott's Triple Action today. It's guaranteed or your money back. Feed your lawn. Feed it. This episode is brought to you by Circle. Digital currency is helping to form the base layer for a new global commerce infrastructure. And stable coins like USDC issued by Circle help to bring faster payments at internet scale. From merchants at the point of sale to corporations that want to pay global suppliers and even employees, it's all done more efficiently. Visit circle.com slash Spotify to learn more. Hey everyone, Ray here. The combat movie Dirty Dozen was a blockbuster. I think we can all agree that broke the mold. Its startling plot about angry criminals and misfits forced into a suicide mission by people in power resonated with audiences living through the political turmoil, societal change, and the escalation of the Vietnam War. Its cast was an ensemble of World War II veterans, turn actors, at the time unknown, but found their careers about to be launched into the stratosphere. The controversial movie went on to become an unanticipated sleeper hit, won an Academy Award, and is now in the pantheon of classic combat flicks. The new book, Killing Generals, The Making of the Dirty Dozen, the most iconic World War II movie of all time, is a riveting must-read for military fans, film buffs, and anyone who loves a down-and-dirty, if you will forgive the pun, adventure tale. Killing Generals is available everywhere books are sold. I've got mine. Go get yours. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 411, The Deadly Game of Dodgeball. Last time, Italian sub-captain Farini of the Axum had achieved a staggering hat trick. Four torpedoes launched, three ships hit. Even better for the Axis, Force X, responsible for getting the merchantman and the tanker Ohio to Malta, had just lost two of its four cruisers, Burroughs flagship Nigeria and the anti-aircraft specialist Cairo. And as for the Ohio, she was now aflame as her crew rushed around to engage the fires. For if she went the way of the two cruisers, it would be more than fair to call pedestal a failure right there and then. For foodstuffs were not as important if there were no planes, subs, or ships to protect the Maltese. In other words, they would be able to eat, but only as Italian prisoners. When all three ships were hit, no surprise, they slowed down considerably, with the two cruisers coming to a complete halt, whereas the Ohio's sharp decrease in speed threatened the freighter behind her, Empire Hope. As the Ohio slowed and turned, out of control for the moment, the entire crew of Empire Hope suddenly realized they were about to slam into a flaming oil freighter. Not a good recipe for continued living. The crewmen of the Empire Hope threw fenders over the forecastle, the upper part of the forward deck, to soften the crash that they knew all was coming. Captain Dudley Mason, master of the Ohio, and had been master for all of 28 days to this point, heard the Empire Hope ring for hard astern. The two ships missed each other by mere feet. The Axis job was almost done by momentum and explosives. Staying with the Ohio, the torpedo, which caused considerable damage, also shot a water geyser high into the air. When it came down, some of the flames had been doused, but not all. These would have to be put out by hand. Men started yelling for extinguishers. Not that it helped much, but the crews of the Ohio and Santa Elisa quickly figured out, minutes after the attack, that when the Elisa had slowed down to eight knots to let Ohio get ahead of her on her starboard side, when they were changing from four to two columns to get through the narrows, if the torpedo had missed the Ohio, it would have most certainly hit the Santa Elisa. Such had been their proximity 
when the Axum let loose her torpedoes. Uncommonly, the Ohio did not begin to list, which is doubly fortunate as it is a tanker, and for her crew, and for those waiting for her contents on Malta. However, the magnitude of the damage dawned on the captain as the crew fought multiple fires and reported in what they saw. Master Mason would later describe it this way. The deck on the port side was torn up and laid right back inboard, nearly to the center line. There was a hole in her hull on the port side, 24 feet by 27 feet, reaching from the main deck to well below the waterline. The large Samson derrick post fell over to an angle of 45 degrees. The flying bridge was damaged and the pump room was ablaze and completely open to the sea. Four kerosene tanks were opened up to the sea on the port side. Their lids were blown off and flames were coming up through the hatches. Three steering gear telemeter pipes were carried away by the explosion. Also the electric cable and all steam pipes in the vicinity of the pump room. As this ship was a part of a convoy, the cardinal sin was to stop for any reason. But Mason had no choice. He told his chief engineer, finish with engines, because he wanted to get the men out of the engineering room. Also, the steering was out, so why waste fuel traveling in a circle? Besides, going round and round would put other ships in danger, as there were still other vessels behind the Ohio now trying to overtake her. Mason left the bridge and joined his men in fighting the fires, yelling for more extinguishers to be brought forward. Fortunately, though probably due to sheer desperation, the fires in the pump room and those of the kerosene tanks were smothered out with foam as the men walked ever closer to the heat. Meanwhile, the destroyer Pathfinder went round and round the wounded tanker, dropping depth charges, just in case there was a diligent U-boat commander somewhere nearby. The convoy sailed on, its mission more important than just one ship, even the lone tanker. Adding a sad note to the Ohio, when the torpedo hit, two gunners and a galley boy, believing the ship was lost, tried to lower number five boat, but it flipped over on the way down. The men and boy were tossed into the sea, never to be seen again. However, the story would be a bit different for Assistant Stuart Morton. Just as the sub Axum had submerged, the last air attack of the day came in. Morton would be washed overboard, as he had been helping with a Browning machine gun on the port side. Years later, he still does not remember actually going overboard or the first few minutes of bobbing on the surface. The torpedo that hit the Ohio sent up water and oil, and the latter came down on the young steward, covering him like a second skin. When he awoke, he was in the water, and he heard a few others nearby yelling for help. The ships went by, apparently not seeing those stranded in the water. But even if they had, all ships were under orders not to stop, not for anything. Those that could get through would get through but not if they stopped to help someone else. Then the German planes came. Some of them had Italian pilots in them, and they strafed the bobbing men in the water. Fortunately, all bullets missed. But the experience had been too much for a 15-year-old galley boy named Mario. When the bullets had slammed into the water, he was petrified. Now that it was clear that they had all missed, Mario's fear turned to anger. He yelled, you stupid bastards, you couldn't hit a barn door, which is when Morton found his voice and yelled, for God's sake, shut up, they'll hear you and they'll come back. These men and boy floated for three hours. Then a destroyer was spotted coming at them. The soaked group gave a collective sigh of relief. Based on the true story that shocked the world. I am... Critics are calling A Spy Among Friends on MGM Plus a thrilling new Cold War drama. Treason. That's what I'm accusing you of. With spellbinding performances. I am not a traitor! Starring Emmy Award winners Damian Lewis and Guy Pearce. You're trying to get me killed. Give me one reason why not. I lonesome. A Spy Among Friends. Watch now, only on MGM Plus. 
As for the man who made all this possible, Captain Ferrini, he quickly found that he was the center of attention, which is never a good thing when one is in a metal can underwater. He noted in his log, 7.55 p.m., 4 minutes 30 seconds after firing. While at 65 meters depth, the hunt begins with a pattern of death charges being fired. It is noticed that each time the boat rises between 80 and 90 meters, the transmissions of the Aztecs are clearly heard, followed immediately by depth charges. Decide to remain between 100 and 120 meters, or 328 or 393 feet, respectively. The Stuka dive bombers, when they came, there were about a dozen, flew at mast height, but didn't stick around to finish off the Ohio. Yes, she was strafed, as were the men in the water, but soon the planes were flying to the east by southeast. The merchant crewmen manning the Borfer guns congratulated each other on chasing the enemy away. But the officers knew those planes and their payloads were heading for the majority of the convoy a few miles ahead. This wasn't over yet. And just to give a taste of what is to come, when Captain Farini and the Axum resurfaced at 10.50 p.m., he saw three ships burning and assumed they were the ones that he had hit, the Nigeria, Cairo, and Ohio. They were not, but three more victims of what had just taken place while the sub was hiding below. When Admiral Burroughs' flagship Nigeria had been torpedoed and he transferred himself, his flag, and his staff to the destroyer Ashanti, Captain A.S. Russell, commander of the cruiser HMS Kenya, had tried to reach the Force X commander by radio. There was only silence on the other end, and so Russell, as was his responsibility, though perhaps a bit too hastily applied, and his temperament, took command of the convoy. As the reduced pedestal moved away from the three stricken ships, Russell ordered four course changes, one after the other. Perhaps he thought there were still subs around. Perhaps he wanted to give the merchant crews something to focus on, rather than losing their flagship. Either way, by the time the orders had been carried out, pedestal was chaotic. There are other stronger descriptive words, but that was Russell's assessment. Though Admiral Seifert, in overall command, was sailing in the opposite direction, he was none too happy with Russell's first move as convoy commander. Also, he realized with the Nigeria and the Cairo out of action, Force X was now dangerously weak. To compensate, he ordered the anti-aircraft cruiser Charybdis and the bigger-than-average tribal-class destroyers Eskimo and Somali to turn around and join Force X at speed. More good news, Malta was sending four bow fighters to watch over the ships, as long as they could. Problem was, the pilots did not know where exactly the convoy was, and as Nigeria and Cairo had been the only ships to have high-frequency radios that could make contact with the fighters, the planes had to fly around a bit. Finally, they spotted the Kenya Russell's ship, leading the now very scattered pedestal. But as the four bow fighters approached the Kenya, her gun crews opened up. The planes cursed, got out of range, and headed home. Strike two for Captain Russell. The convoy was now just west of the Skerke Bank. To the numerous Italian subs submerged at the mouth of the Narrows, all before this, had just been window dressing. The ships would have to pass right through here, and the Italian crews were most eager to come to grips with the ships of the enemy. So, Captain Russell's log entry at 9.11 p.m. will come as no surprise. Kenya was hit in the forepeak, the most forward internal part of the ship, by a torpedo. Another torpedo passed under the ship, almost abreast the bridge, and two more narrowly missed the stern, passing down the port side. The main machinery and all communications were found correct, but the maximum available speed was not known. I joined the Manchester, a heavy cruiser, and hoped the convoy would get reformed. 
strike three. By this time, the sun had set 30 minutes ago. The 24 ships and the convoy were still reeling from Russell's multiple zigzags when 30 JU-88s came in. Being most clever, they had flown in that gray area in between the sea and the stars, and they weren't alone. The gun crews reacted as drilled, turned their guns, and started firing, which is exactly what the Axis plan called for. Suddenly, out of seemingly nowhere, seven HE-111 torpedo bombers came in low. The gunners were suddenly unsure of what their priority should be. Death from on high, or the death threat coming in low. The AA response was less than organized, which reduces effectiveness. And then, 12 Stukas, in groups of three, approached from four different directions. The gunners were truly overwhelmed now, and one of the ships in the front that would be targeted was the freighter Santa Elisa. What made this extra surreal for the AA crews on the ships was that the North African Stukas were painted in camouflage to look like leopard skin, more psychological warfare. Normally, the Stuka would have two 50-kilo bombs under each wing and a large 500-kilo explosive under her fuselage. But what did these specific Stukas carry? Time would tell, and not very much time at that. It's worth mentioning an observation from a RAF chief test pilot who got to fly a captured Stuka. Quote, The JU-87D did not appear to find its natural element until it was diving steeply. It seemed quite normal to stand this aircraft on its nose in a vertical dive, with the speed climbing up to 373 miles per hour. During the dive, it was necessary to watch the signal light on the contact altimeter, and when it came on, a knob on the control column was depressed to initiate the automatic pullout, with forces on the pilot reaching 6G during completion of the maneuver. Also noteworthy, of all the dive bombers, even those of the Allies, only the Stuka could dive vertically, making bomb accuracy much more accurate. Once the bombs of whatever combination were dropped by the plane, it would start to pull out at 1,475 feet. This was tested and implemented in 1938, by the famous female pilot, Mylita Scheller. Given the speed and gravity, most Stukas leveled out at 100 feet, but that's when they're at their most vulnerable. Of course, one has to factor in that they were going about 370 miles per hour, and their bombs have already landed, giving the gun crews and everyone else on board something else to think about and react to. Yet, one slip-up by the Stuka pilot and the dive bomber could easily become an unwilling kamikaze. This episode is brought to you by Ali. Time to get real about the new year. Pressure-filled resolutions are out, and evolutions are in. Sure, lofty wellness goals are great, but little steps count too. Think bite-sized health goals for big wins. So get better sleep for our blissful melatonin glands, or get upbeat with Hello Happy. Get in the mood with love and libido. Or get moving with daily energy. Be your very best you. Or just be. Ali is here to help you do wellness goals your way. Zero pressure, just delightful gummies, soft gels, and fast dissolves. Ali. Supplements for your New Year's evolution. Learn more at Ollie.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now, at some time in most everyone's life, certainly those listening to this, you have probably played dodgeball, and memories of that most particular sport quickly conjure up dread or excitement, depending on your physical ability to throw and dodge. Well, try playing that, but with bombs. A writer and former seaman apprentice wrote the following brilliant observation. Stuka pilots were sometimes teenagers, like many of the Hurricane and Spitfire pilots. They were all daring, but if the British boys were dashing, the Italians were wild, and the Germans, steely. And the Axis pilots brought their wild, steely ways to the ships of pedestal. 
The way dodge bomb works is that the destroyer captain and the dive bomber pilot go up against each other. Of course, if the captain gets it wrong, many around him, perhaps all, may die. For the pilot, if he gets it wrong, then he and his rear gunner will be no more. It was a game being played in many parts of the world at the moment, and again, most of those involved were very young men. The pilot makes the first move, i.e. he dives and then drops his bomb, and at that moment, it's the destroyer captain's turn. He watches the plane, he watches the bomb, and once it drops, he then has to yell out the correct course or speed change to be in a different place from where the bomb lands. If he is successful, he gets to do it again and again and again until all the bombs have been dropped or he gets it wrong. That normally only happens once. The Ehrlichon gunners on the freighters had 60 rounds in a magazine. The cartridges are inserted by hand in the following order. Tracer, armor piercing, incendiary, solid. And as they could fire at a rate of 450 rounds per minute, if the trigger is held down, there are 8 seconds worth in the magazine. Hence, the men are trained and encouraged to shoot in 3-second bursts. And at this moment, the Stukas were diving down, and the Ehrlichons were firing almost straight up. Again, almost straight up. There were stoppers, so the guns could not be fired too low, might hit the ship, or too high and the other guns were less capable than the Ehrlichans. On came the Stukas, driving past the red and gold tracers of the Ehrlichans, Borfas, and Flak from the pom-poms. Indeed, many times the Stukas were actually hit, but with glancing blows that put holes in them. Still, they kept coming. Gravity would demand no less. BBC broadcaster Anthony Kimmins reported that there were 30 JU-88s and 12 Stukas over the ships now. He was exhausted by the day's events and hoped only to see the sun the next day. An ensign on the freighter, Santa Elisa, noted, This was the most concentrated attack of all. Three more merchant ships were hit by bombs. One ship, astern of us, was hit, exploded violently, and burst into flames. The ju 88 dropped a stick of bombs on us, again straddling the ship. An engineer on the same freighter reported, A bomber drops a stick of 500 pounders so close to our port bow that I can almost reach out and touch them. As he cuts away from us, a seaman picks up a monkey wrench and lets fly at him with a beautiful sidearm delivery. I feel like telling him not to be a damn fool throwing away equipment like that, but I know how helpless he feels. Nice try, I say. He grins sheepishly. As for the gunners on board, well, it was a little different for them. As they were in combat, they all wore their woolen anti-flash hoods and long sleeves. So near misses caused massive splashes that landed on the men and guns, cooling them off, the men and guns. These men, instead of throwing monkey wrenches, simply yelled out, Thanks! The gunners on the Santa Elisa were known to be trigger-happy, but at this moment, everyone was. Of course, the Brits gave each other winks on this subject. They assumed that all Americans were like this. Another freighter, Ameria Likes, also American-built, was putting up her own shells and tracers. Before this attack was over, the gunners on this ship would take down two enemy planes. Not surprisingly, the gun's barrels started to get hot, really hot, as in melting enough to be defective, hot, and that could not be allowed to happen. So the 21-year-old gunner yelled, Get a bucket of water, bud! The barrel's melting, and there's more of the bastards coming! And indeed, there were. As he spoke, yet another Stuka was flying over the freighter. Down below the Santa Elisa, Fred Larson was on one of the guns. He had been there all day, but his anger at the Germans pushed him on. And at this moment, he was watching the latest Stuka with a 500-kilo bomb strapped to its belly coming right at him. 
Now, tracers from the other nearby ships tried to make contact with this screaming Stuka, but its speed was too much. The bright streaks of light simply passed harmlessly behind the diving metal beast. This was the moment that tested the young German's pilot's nerves. He had to hold still until the red light on the altimeter flashed. That's when he would release his bombs and begin to pull up. Meanwhile, Larson, who had also lined up his shot, also held off. He wanted to wait until the plane was so close he could not miss. It was a gamble, but there was a war on. Every day was a gamble. Now Larson let loose with the tracers, and when the Stuka was inside the center of concentric circles that was his aiming device, he pulled the trigger. A second later, the Stuka became a flash, and then it became thousands of pieces of metal, some big, some small, but all now heading earthward. Fred Larson stayed with his Ehrlichan gun a bit longer, but then he went to his next most common place that of the ship's flying bridge, above the enclosed bridge, to stand next to Captain Thompson. And it was while standing there that both men and the crew heard a massive explosion. As their eyes turned to the bright light, they realized that's where the cargo steamer Clan Ferguson had just been. The Ferguson was the smallest freighter in pedestal, but she was also the most heavily armed. What with two Borfors, eight Ehrlichens, four Fams, four pack rockets, two pig troughs, and several machine guns. But none of that mattered, as a torpedo bomber had snuck in in the darkness, slamming an explosive into the ship's starboard beam. Whatever was left of the Clan Ferguson, no matter the size, it was on fire. The other crews heard screams for the next 30 minutes, but the memories of those screams would last forever. But it was those very emotions that have skewed memories. Actually, there was a few minutes in between when the torpedo hit and the 1,500 tons of ammunition in the number 5 hold ignited, causing the massive explosion. Hours later, 64 survivors of the Clan Ferguson were spotted by an Italian sub. Soon, a German flying boat arrived and made 32 of the men get on board. The ranking British officer made sure the most seriously wounded were taken. The Germans handled them with care. The next day, an Italian Red Cross plane landed and took away seven more men, again the most injured. On August 17th, the remaining survivors ended up in a cove, and then they were taken in by local Italians. The men were treated kindly, but then Vichy soldiers came along and took them. In time, the survivors, well, the ones the French had, were all brought together. But it would be during the chaos created by Operation Torch, the landing of American troops in North Africa, that the POWs would escape, at least most of them. Back to when the air attack had been underway, bombs from three JU-88s rained down on the cargo liner Empire Hope. She had put to sea only the year before. The bombs missed, but landed close enough to create a 15-foot hole in the side, as well as knocking out the engines, pumps, and cooling system. The Empire was dead in the water, which allowed a more accurate attack to then take place. And this attack penetrated and exploded the number four hold, which had ammunition and kerosene within. Then two more bombs struck true. As the resulting fire spread unchecked, Captain Williams ordered, abandon ship. Quickly, the destroyer Penn came alongside and started taking on survivors. Then she finished off the Empire Hope with a torpedo to keep her out of the hands of the enemy. The refrigerated cargo liner Brisbane Star had been close to the Empire Hope when she was practically struck down. An emergency maneuver saved the star, that is, until the torpedo made contact, that her turn had made possible. This explosive had come from an HE-111 torpedo bomber, and the result was a hole big enough to drive a speedboat through, according to several witnesses. 
But as she could still move under her own power, though barely, she was turned south to make for the Tunisian coast. Vichy waters were also not off limits to damaged ships. With the Brisbane Star crawling closer to shore, the ship's crew watched as the surviving ships of Pedestal passed by. Then a gasp rose from the crewmen as the blackened tanker Ohio went by. Everyone had assumed she was lost, as fire and fuel hardly go well together, or rather, go too well together. But there she was. Between the crew and the inrushing water, the fires had been put out. Still, her deck was white hot. That would take a while to cool down, but for now, the Ohio was still afloat. What a beautiful day in nature! Take it from a little bug like me, nothing makes you feel more alive! <laughs> oh, whoa, I almost got frogged. That was a close call. But boy, do I feel capital A alive! Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Women's Multivitamin Gummies with 16 vitamins and minerals. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. <laughs> whoa, better luck next time, pal. Nature's Way. 